All right, welcome to our featured session of our conference, Tall Tales of Texas Conservation. We have an illustrious panel of, uh, of, of guests up here, and I am going to introduce our moderator. Unfortunately, Carter Smith um, is unable to make it, and he just, uh, they called us earlier today. He's up at the legislature working on... Uh, important issues for state parks. So um, we're gonna leave him there doing that good work. And uh, Jeff Francell with the Nature Conservancy has uh, generously stepped in and he's gonna do a fabulous job. Jeff is the Director of Land and Water Protection for the Nature Conservancy here in Texas. Uh, he's worked in the conservation field since 1996. I'm not going to speak for very long. I do want to introduce the panel. I'm not going to give too much on their on their bios because I think many of you know who they are and have been involved in, in the conservation world for quite a while. But I, I do want to say um, I've worked for three of the four people here. Um, I've, uh, I, I've professionally uh, embarrassed myself in front of all of them at least <laughs> once, with Je in Jeff Weigel's case, more than once. So, uh, but it is really an honor to be here talking about uh, this topic and, uh, and going through some of the stories that they will go through. Uh, a little bit of frame of reference, I think, of why uh, I, I do what, what I do or how I got involved in, in what I got involved in is my family uh, is from West Texas and uh, we, I would go with my great grandmother from Fort Davis to Boyce Camp Meeting in the summertime and she had a, a two-door Opal that was loud and noisy and didn't have an air conditioner. And, uh, and we would drive right by the, the uh, real estate signs, billboards for the Davis Mountains Resort. And my great grandmother would look at me, it would just be me and her in the car, and she would say, that's a bad thing. And uh, I think uh, that stuck with me, that's why I'm here. And um, I'm gonna let uh, Andy talk a little bit about uh, the, the wonderful things he's done in his career, or just a few of them. This is a wonderful, wonderful occasion and it, it's so cool to see so many of you that I have worked with over the years and so many younger people and and folks that are getting into the land conservation aspects of our movement uh, I think it's of all of the things that you can do in conservation I feel the strongest bond with those those of us who have been involved in land conservation and I appreciate everything that you do I was intrigued by Jeff's comments at the earlier, earlier panel, for those of you who were there. He's talking about Don McIver, who, who was the original, one of the owners of the U Up, U Down, and it reminded me of the fact that, a, you know, we could, this kind of conversation should better take place over the, at the bar tonight, <laughs> because the, probably the most interesting thing about these transactions is the people that were involved in them. When we first met Don McIver, uh, I was working for the Nature Conservancy, and he was, uh, from the very m first time we met him, interested in selling his ranch. The problem was, as Jeff mentioned earlier, he had sisters and a mother who owned most of it, and he could not speak alone. And so finally, after a couple of years of him telling me that, I said, well, Don, why don't I just go see your mother? because he had told me that she lived in Connecticut and she would have to be the one that would make the decision. And he said, well, you're welcome to do it. And he gave me her phone number. And so I called her and I said, Ms. McIver, I'm Andrew Sansom and I work at the Nature Conservancy and I've been working with your son and I would really like to talk to you about uh, buying the ranch. And she said, oh, Mr. Sansom, she says, I come down to San Antonio every year and I stay in that Minger Hotel and I'll be down there this Christmas, and I, you know, I'd love to meet you there, and we'll talk about it. And I was so excited, and I called Don up, and I said, Don, I talked to your mom, and she said she wants to come down and stay in the Minger and talk to me about selling the ranch. And he said, Andy, she's been saying that for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> so during that, during that same time, the Davis Mountains was considered to be about the last place in Texas that would really be suitable for a national park. And I was sitting in my office at, on Alamo Plaza one day and I got a call from now deceased uh, Don McIver who had done so much to identify the, I mean, excuse me, Don Kennard, who had done so much to identify the important natural areas of Texas. And he said, we got ourselves a speaker. 
and Jim Wright from Fort Worth had been elected Speaker of the House. And so we got together and we got Congressman Don Coleman out in El Paso to appropriate $100,000 to study the Davis Mountains as a site for a new national park. So the first thing the Park Service does is to put out an ad in all the newspapers in West Texas with a map of Jeff Davis County with a big circle drawn around it. Notice, you are called to a public meeting to discuss a national park in Jeff Davis County. 500 people showed up at the meeting, ran the Park Service out of town. Coleman called a press conference at the El Paso airport the next morning and said, we'll put that money somewhere else. <laughs> and the Davis Mountains Transpecus Association was formed in Fort Davis the next morning. So thankfully, the, my successors here on, at, the, at the Rostrum and elsewhere have done such a wonderful job out there. This slide that, that uh, we started with this evening was one of the most beautiful places in Texas, and I won't spend a lot of time on it, but to say that when I first met Jim Neal and went to work for the Nature Conservancy in 1982, it was located above a porn shop on 6th Street. <laughs> and there was probably 35 people that were giving the Nature Conservancy more than $100 a year. The national, I had not done my homework very well. I was so excited about going to work for getting back into our movement that I really didn't ask a whole lot of questions. In my first day of work, I, Jim was giving me a briefing on current projects and he said, well, the national office talked us into buying this place called Honey Creek for three and a half million dollars and they're about to foreclose on it because we haven't been able to raise the money for it. So I thought, well, you know, it makes sense. It's right next to the Guadalupe River State Park. We'll talk to the Parks and Wildlife Department and maybe they want it. Well, I came down to Austin and I, I went over to see Parks and Wildlife and basically they said two things. Number one, the most important thing was that they were annoyed with the Nature Conservancy because apparently they, they had also talked about buying it and there was some confusion, there wasn't very good communication and so they ended up irritating the one customer that probably would have been a natural buyer for it. Number two, we had just passed a duck stamp in Texas and the, and the purpose of the duck stamp was to purchase wetland habitat and they hadn't been able to buy any land, and so the duck hunters were getting pretty anxious about, about those acquisitions. So at the same time, and, 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 and I'll tell you that for me, a lot of this is, is, it goes under the category of every once in a while even a blind hog finds an acorn, because at the same time, Dow Chemical and a number of other petrochemical companies had acquired a magnificent piece of property along the Texas coast, which was called CDOC. And it was, it was uh, acquired to build a very large terminal so that you could have a, a floating dock out in the Gulf where tankers from the Middle East would come and offload crude oil. It would come into shore through a pipeline and be, a, and be stored on this property for distribution in the refineries. And it was one of the most coolest wetlands anywhere on the coast. That project had failed and the companies were trying to figure out what to do with, with this land. And I met Jim Jeffries, who was, a, at, as all of you know, the president of this organization for a while. <clears throat> and we looked at the values of both Honey Creek and that piece of property there on the coast. And at the time, they, the, their combined value was about $12 million. Well, it, the tax laws were such at the time that we owed three million or so on Honey Creek and the, and the tax laws would enable us to basically go to these companies and pay them about a third of the market value. They could donate the rest and we would acquire the property. So I was able to go to Parks and Wildlife and say, look, I've got 12 million acres of land. One of them is this wetland on the coast, which you can buy with your duck stamp money. And the other one is Honey Creek and you can have them both for six million dollars. So, so they took the deal. And I went to work at Parks and Wildlife later on. <laughs> I, of all the places that I've had the wonderful privilege of working on, the one that probably is 
maybe closest to my heart, one of the two, is at Matagorda Island. When I was a uh, young aide in the Interior Department in Washington, Bob Armstrong had been elected land commissioner, and one of the things that he did was he began to lease offshore oil development on the near shore in, in a fairly aggressive program. And one of the tracks that he attempted to lease was offshore Matagorda Island. Well, it caused a firestorm among two uh, different interest groups. One was the Defense Department, because the Air Force was still basically conducting certain uh, uh, military weapons training activities there, and they figured that the oil development would interrupt them. And two, Matagorda, as you know, is the home of many of the, of the whooping cranes. And so the Audubon Society, where I later became a board member, was extremely upset with the idea of the offshore oil development. So the secretary called me into his office and he said, you know anything about this Matagord Island place? Well, once again, Don Kennard had identified it as one of the key, most important natural areas in the state. And so all I knew about it was what I had read in Kennard's report. So I told him what I knew and he told me that he wanted me to go down there and see whether, what, what the real story was. So. I found the one man in, in Washington in the Fish and Wildlife Service who know, knew most about whooping cranes, and he and I went down there. And we spent three days on the island in 1972. And basically what happened while we were there was a plane load of generals flew in from Vietnam to go deer hunting. And we basically determined that the principal use that was being made of the island at that time was a recreation area. But there was enough uh, weapons training still going on that we concluded that it was inhibiting at least the northward expansion of the Hooper's territory. So I wrote a report, the secretary signed it and sent it to the Secretary of Defense recommending that the island be, that the military activities stop and that the island become part of the National Wildlife Refuge System. We, made, we had made a deal with the Audubon Society that we would, if, if we did not get action out of the Defense Department, that we would slip them the report. And so about Christmas time, nothing had happened. There was no response at all. And so I leaked the report to the National Audubon Society. <laughs> and I got on the bus. I lived out in Virginia at the time. I got on the bus to go to work. And I picked up the Washington Post. And there was a big photograph of the whoopers on the front page. And I was, on the one hand, extremely excited, but also I knew that I was doomed. <laughs> <clears throat> so I went into work, and sure enough, um, it wasn't long before I was told that uh, my services were not needed at the Interior Department any longer. There was a wonderful U.S. Senator at the time from Wisconsin named William Proxmire. And Proxmire picked up the report, did a complete congressional investigation of what was going on down there. And in fact, a year later, the base was closed and it is today a National Wildlife Refuge. I had the great privilege when I went to work later for the Nature Conservancy to acquire the last 13,000 acres on the southern end of the ranch from the Wynn family of Dallas. And so now the whole, whole ranch is protected and managed in a unique partnership between Parks and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service, and um, and, to, and uh, the general land office. The last one that these kind people have showed on the slides is the Big Men Ranch. And, and I think you're gonna hear from some of my colleagues up here that these transactions and these projects take a long time. There's multiple people, generations of people are involved in them. And certainly Big Ben Ranch is example of that. I can't tell you how excited I was to read in the Texas Monthly, which I went down to the Treasury Department and, and, and bought every month uh, to, to read of home, to learn that an environmentalist had been elected to the General Land Office, and that was Bob Armstrong, and I couldn't, I couldn't imagine. And so I, I was only like 26 years old at the time, but I called him and I told him how excited I was, and the next time he, he came to Washington, he came to see me at the Interior Department. And all he could talk about was Big Ben Ranch. And this was in 1973, probably. And, it, and I'll never forget that his descriptions were mainly of the stars. 
I mean, I kept trying to get him to talk about the habitat and the landscape and everything else, but he kept telling me how magnificent this guy was in Big Ben and how, uh, how, how it had marked him. Well, many years later, after two tries in the Texas legislature and the ranch had not been acquired, I went out there with a board member of the Nature Conservancy whose name was B.K. Johnson. And Mr. Johnson was uh, familiar with the Anderson family that owned the ranch at the time, and so he arranged for us to go out there and take a look at it. We flew out there in May, and those of you, I know everybody in the room has probably been in Big Ben. Well, May's not the best time to go. And we flew out there in Mr. Johnson's plane, and it was so rough that it just heaved like this the whole time. And we finally landed, and B.K. Johnson leaned over to me as we were stepping down the gangplank on the plane and said, I feel like the Pope. And I turned around, and he said, I want to kiss the ground. <laughs> <laughs> It was one rough airplane flight. We tried, I worked on it seven years, and we tried any number of times to make a deal with the Anderson family and, and to connect right with the politics here in Austin. And it's hard to imagine to take yourself back now to about 1988. The legislature was actually criticizing the Parks and Wildlife Department because the department was not acquiring enough land. It's, it's just hard to imagine today, but that was the circumstance in, when I, in which I went to work for Texas Parks and Wildlife. We, we had such trouble making a deal with them that we finally actually wrote a letter to the Anderson family saying we we're no longer interested in trying to buy the ranch. So I got a call about Christmas time in, in uh, 1987 from Phelps Anderson, who was one of the Anderson children, and he said, I think that we're ready to do it. And these guys were petroleum people. And so they deal with millions of barrels or hundreds of thousands of gallons. And so a few cents per gallon meant a lot to them. And this whole transaction swung on like, is it going to be $42.53 or $42.12? I mean, but if you're talking to hundreds of thousands of acres, it, that amounts to some money. And so he calls me and he says, I think we're ready to make a deal. So I went in to see my boss at the time, who was Dickie Travis, whom I'll always be grateful to. And I said, Mr. Travis, I think the Andersons are ready to do it. He says, OK, you know, I'll let you go out there, but we can't tell a soul. Well, at the time, I was doing what Jeff is now doing for the Parks and Wildlife Department. And I had made arrangements to go to Amarillo and meet with some landowners up there about Playa Lakes. So I flew to Amarillo, I called the landowners and postponed the, uh, the, the, those conversations, and I drove over to Roswell and spent three days with the Andersons in total secret. Dickie was smart enough to realize that if we let it out, somebody would, would torpedo it, because by that time the heat had begun to build against land acquisition and so he knew that if, we, if, we, if any word leaked out that we would probably not be able to do it. And so I, I'll never forget, I was, when we finally cut the deal, I was driving back over to Amarillo and I called him in the middle of the night and we both wept on the phone. And uh, we, did, we didn't even tell Armstrong until we had it under contract. And uh, I was out there last year, with a, or two years ago, with my family and my grandchild who was five years old at the time, and I, he lives in New Jersey, and so he seemed to have a good time, <laughs> but his mother sent me a, a project that he had done in kindergarten, and he, he was given an assignment to select an animal that migrated and tell where it would migrate to and why, and he picked an eagle. And he said that it would migrate to Texas so that he could go out to Big Bend and see the stars. Mm. And I have that framed in my home. Thank you very much. So the, the story of, of uh, the creation of Big Bend Ranch State Park was 
it was so interesting to me that I spent six months writing my master's thesis about it. And in doing that, um, I ended up getting a job at Parks and Wildlife. And I realized that uh, the, the organization that was doing most of the conservation on the ground in the state was the Nature Conservancy. And Robert Potts was the state director of the Nature Conservancy. And the Nature Conservancy hired me. And um, I, uh, it was at that time that I witnessed a, an act of bravery that, looking back, uh, is, is a, a seminal moment for conservation in the state of Texas, but I was at the board meeting where the Nature Conservancy decided to, to buy about 25,000 acres on South Padre Island. And I think uh, that's what Robert's gonna talk about a lot, but that was a, a moment uh, in time and uh, that, that uh, I will remember forever. So, Robert? <clears throat> Even though I, it seems like a long time ago when I first became state director of the Nature Conservancy, which is back in 1995, as you've heard from Andy, following a number of folks that had been working on conservation for, for quite a while and had established some pretty important priorities. And one of the priorities that uh, when I started at the Conservancy was, was one that was kind of on the, the, the hope for list was South Padre Island. And I think probably most of you know where that is. There's a town down there, but we're really talking about the, the beachfront that's north of the town. If you drive out of town and you go up that paved road, really where it ends um, is, and then from there to the Mansfield Cut is really was a, always a big priority for, for the organization and for conservation in Texas. And it's important because, you know, the Laguna Bandre is so important from a biodiversity standpoint. And there were so many pieces of this that had already been put in place. If you go north of the Mansfield Cut, you're, you've got the national seashore. But there was this big gap between really the, the, the developed area of South Padre and up to the Mansfield Cut that so many people felt like was going to be a priority if the Laguna Madre, which is a fairly fragile system, was going to uh, continue to, to be as wonderful as it is. And this had gotten started. I mean, persistence is really, I think, the theme of so much of this. This had gotten started back when Andy was, was, uh, was the state director. Um, and um, I think you were the second state director. There was one that was there about a year. But for the in terms of any tenure, you were really the first state director. And I, I was just going to ask him to tell about how it got started before I pick up the rest of the story. Well, we, uh, there was a wonderful um, a man that worked for uh, American General Life Insurance Company, whose name was Richard Randall. And Richard Randall was a contributor to the Nature Conservancy. And so we, we basically used the network of the organization to find someone in the company who frankly was very sympathetic and once again he just didn't have the support with his institution but he wanted to do it from day one, Richard Randall. And so this company owned 25,000 acres there. Uh, it wasn't all the land between South Padre and the Mansfield Cut. There were in holdings in between and some of that's going to become important in this story in a minute. But they owned the, the bulk of it, and we felt like that if we could, we could get that, we could, really, uh, we could really make a difference down there on that Laguna Madre system. We had talked with Fish and Wildlife Service. Fish and Wildlife Service was very interested in adding that to their Laguna Atascosa refuge there, which is on the mainland part of the Laguna Madre. And, um, and, but, you know, this company owned it, had, you know, it had if it could be developed, would be very, very valuable resource. And the question was whether they were going to try and do that. And so, as Andy said, he kind of got, got the ball started. Andy's successor was David Braun. David went and met with them and tried to, you know, push the ball forward, but they weren't really quite ready. James King, who was our director of protection, met with them a number of times, but the time was just really not right for them to sell it. And um, a few years late, later, I was, uh, I was speaking to a business group, a group of, of business people, telling them about the Nature Conservancy and our projects around. And I didn't mention this project because it wasn't one that was active for us. But at the end of the, at the, end of the, uh, the talk, somebody came up to me and said, I know what y'all are trying to do down there on South Padre Island, and I'm going to make sure you don't get to do it. And I said... What, what are you talking about? And he said, well, I'm, I'm a landowner in between some of this property, and I want to see it all developed. 
And uh, I know James King's running around down there, but I've got it taken care of. And we're, we're just, we're, it's, it, it's going to be developed. It's, you know, we're going to make a lot of money on it. So too bad. So, okay, well, I just smiled. A um, couple years later, uh, the company approached us and they said, we're ready to sell it. And, you know, like I said, this has been going on for years. We had been ready. Uh, we had talked to a number of people, and they said, uh, we, we want to sell it. Problem is, over that time, even though $250 an acre is not a lot of money for beach, for beach property, uh, you had a lot of property, you know, and you're talking about $8 million or so uh, project, and they wanted to sell it right then. So we, as Jeff alluded to, um, we decided to, to buy it. We weren't real sure what we were going to do with it. We weren't real sure how we were going to raise the money, but we knew that it was a priority had been there. We weren't going to pass it up. So after we got it, um, it, this all happened pretty quickly. We got it under option. We went to the Fish and Wildlife Service and said, okay, we've got it. And they looked at us and they said, Whoa, 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 wait, you know, you can't get it under option before we've gone through this hoop and this hoop and this hoop and all of this. And uh, so we may not be able to, to partner with you on this. And I said, well, you know, this is a priority for the organization. It's a priority for conservation. It's something we're going to do. We hope you partner with us and we're going to go ahead and do it. So we did do it, and as Jeff alluded to, it was a big step for the, for the, uh, for the board because we were stepping off into this, uh, big piece of pro this big piece of property with a big debt associated with it, and we weren't real sure how it was going to happen. Our, our priority, of course, was to uh, sell. It made the most sense for it to go to Fish and Wildlife Service. They would be in the best position to manage it. It would be a nice addition to the Laguna Atascosa Refuge. Um, problem was the same landowner who had been uh, opposed to our uh, buying it and had been very frustrated that we had bought it was now doing everything that he could in Washington to keep the Fish and Wildlife Service from buying it. And so we, um, we went round and round on that, but uh, fortunately we're able to get Fish and Wildlife Service, was able to get the approvals and was able to uh, purchase it, and Senator K. Bailey Hutchison deserves a tremendous amount of credit for that. It would not have happened but for uh, her and her staff pushing that through. But it was, uh, it was a long, long process, and we finally, got it, we finally got it bought, we finally got it sold to the Fish and Wildlife Service, but the story really still wasn't over, and if Carter were here, I would have him tell this part of the story, because as Jeff alluded to, Carter was working for us in South Texas at that time. And as I mentioned, this wasn't all of the property in there. There were several inholdings in there, including the inholding of this landowner who had been pretty much opposing us the whole time, and who was not very happy with us, to say the least, um, because felt like that because there was a refuge there, it was going to uh, circumscribe his ability to develop the property and make the money that he wanted to make. So not too long after, um, after all this happened, he put his property up for public auction. It was one of these auctions like you see advertised everywhere. I mean, it, you know, you'd see it in tex advertisements, Texas Monthly. It was a big deal. Uh, they were going to auction this property, and they were going to auction it in different pieces. Well, of course, we were interested in, in buying for the refuge all of those inholdings that, that were there. And so I asked Carter to go down to that auction, and, um, and we had a budget, and he was going to bid uh, for it. We figured out how we could do it. It was, you know, you were going to have to step up and buy it then. It wasn't any, you know, take it back and get approvals type of thing. So he goes down there for the auction. It's a public auction. It's in one of the lobbies of one of the hotels there on South Padre Island and gets there, and they have a security guard out there, and they won't let him go to the auction. <laughs> they, won't, they make him sit out in the, in the lobby, and they're all trying to figure out what to do because, as I said, the landowner doesn't particularly like us and evidently doesn't even want our money if we're going to be buying, uh, buying his property. But um, Carter could tell this story much better than I because he was there, but the, the long and short of it was they finally did let him in once it got started, and he did buy one piece, but then they weren't pleased with the response they were getting, so they called the auction off. So the, the point I'm making is that it's just these deals and these uh, conservation projects that everyone in this room is involved with in different ways, the, the, the key to so many of them is continuity of purpose and, and persistence 
and then being able and being ready to act when the opportunity comes along because oftentimes it, do, it comes at inopportune times when there's some interesting uh, um, uh, obstacles. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity to tell you all about South Park. Well, I'm, I'm pinch hitting for Carter. Uh, Jeff Weigel is uh, pinch hitting for James King. He's going to talk a little uh, bit more about the Davis Mountains Project and the history there and some other nefarious business that he's been involved with uh, over the last. Jeff, you've been in like conservation for 75 years. Yeah. Is that right? That's close. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to get mad at James for not showing up, and then I did notice he sponsored both breakfasts for our conference, so we'll, we'll let him off the hook on that. I did want to acknowledge Andy uh, because when I, I came to Texas in 1985 to go to graduate school at Texas Tech to study fire ecology and met a really interesting guy in the department next door named Bill Kitchens, and I had worked for TNC in the Midwest before that, so I was looking to make connections. I found out Bill was on the on the board of the Texas chapter. So I went over and visited him and boy, anybody who knew Bill Kitchens tells you running around with him was a wild ride. He took me on some great trips to the Big Bend. Uh, at that time, the TNC was working on the donation of what we then called the Panther Ranch from uh, Ed and Houston Hart, 67,000 acres that was donated and is now part of Big Bend National Park. Well, through Bill, I met Andy and uh, started kind of working that a little bit, hoping maybe I'd find a job when I got out. And sure enough, I was grateful that Andy hired me as the stewardship director for the Texas program. Otherwise, I might be back in Wisconsin, so thank you. You always try to hire people that are better than you are. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I cannot pass up the opportunity to tell you that Bill Kitchen was one of the all-time greatest characters, and he was my professor as well. And uh, when the Big Mid Ranch transaction was complete and it actually belonged to Parks and Wildlife, Kitchen had a cabin at Terlingua. And I called him up and I said, Prof, I think I can finally do something for you to repay you for all that I've got from you. I can arrange for you to go into Big Ben Ranch. And he said, no, it's a whole lot more fun to sneak in. <laughs> Bill taught me one other important Texas thing, which that was that in, in the drives we made from Lubbock down to the Big Bend region, he taught me that how you measure trips, it's not by miles, it's by six packs. <laughs> so, um, I, that was back before we had so many lawyers in the organization. <laughs> I wasn't working for TNC then. Um, so, did want to talk about the Davis Mountains, and I wanted to start out first by uh, thanking Andy and Jim Neal for all that great work they did riling up the local residents. <laughs> so when we kind of came in, I started at TNC in July of 87 and had about six months overlap with Andy before he went to Parks and Wildlife and uh, wanted to, well, what I want to talk to you about is sort of some general principles that I think could apply to any project you might work on. But first, can we flip over to the map? I've been accused of not being able to talk about anything without a map, and it's basically true. But just to give you a quick overview of what this looks like now, the darker yellowish green is our core preserve that we own. It's 33,000 acres, includes the highest elevation portions, the summit of Mount Livermore, and then down the drainage for Madeira Creek. And the other color are all the conservation buyer, conservation easement partners that we have that if you were in uh, this previous session where Jeff talked about some of the details of how we put that together, what do we have, about 15 different buyers? Now, some of them on the second and third generation. And we've been lucky enough just recently to add another piece of that puzzle, which isn't even on the map yet. We are able to get a uh, purchased slash gift easement on the summit of Sawtooth Peak. Wow. 2,500 acres or so. That was a real important piece, so he did it. So I'm going to give you a couple small, oh, and the other thing I want to say, this morning I'm looking around the room in the big session. I started ticking off all the people I saw who had worked on this project <laughs> at some point or another in its history. Some 
used to work for TNC, others still do, but I got up to close to 25 people in the room. What's my point? It takes a village of people to get these projects done and it takes a lot of time. It's taken us 30 years to get there. So the first thing I wanna say is you gotta start, you may have to start small, but have a big vision. The first transaction we did in the Davis Mountains was James King somehow figured out that there were two small parcels of land up near the summit of Mount Livermore, and the landowner did not even know he owned them. They were somehow vacancies or something in a survey, and James went up to talk to this guy, Mr. Harris, and first of all, he told him, hey, guess what? You own some land up on the top of the mountain. We don't know where the hell it is, but it's up there somewhere, and then he talked him into selling it to us. So we, with that little stake in the ground, but we had a big vision of what we wanted to do, try to protect that entire Sky Island ecosystem. Uh, and that little point was where we got it going. So if you're working on a project, don't be afraid to start small. Another thing we learned along the way is that you gotta have a big threat. A nice, visible, viable, the uglier, the better kind of threat to get people fired up. And Jeff mentioned this earlier, the Davis Mountains Resort. Apologies to anybody in here who might be a landowner. Uh, I bet there's at least one. Sure. But this couldn't, we couldn't have invented this better. A 7,000 acre piece of property that had been cut up into hundreds of small tracks, two acres, five acres, 10 acres, no restrictions whatsoever. You had everything in there from somebody who had erected a little, you know, metal shed that they bought at Menards and that was their cabin complete without plumbing uh, to $300,000 homes in just this jumble of a mess and it was real easy to show people listen this is what the future of the Davis Mountains could be if we don't get in here and conserve this working first with Mr. McIver so so having that visible threat really important you really got to play that up that that helped motivate our supporters our board members everybody that you know there is something that really could happen here we better work to fix it so here's another principle opposition and obstacles make you stronger <laughs> um, when we were working out there we picked up where Andy and Luke Thompson, who I really want to credit with making the first landowner contacts with Don McIver, he drank about 4,000 gallons of coffee. Uh, James King picked up, and I think he spent nine years courting Mr. McIver, so he probably drank 10,000 gallons. Um, and along the way, we were starting to get our board interested. We had our biologists going out. Mr. McIver actually gave us permission to go out and do biological surveys on the property. He had never done that before. For our scientists, this was like they were back in the golden age of natural history. They were getting to go somewhere that was completely unexplored. And over the course of about three summers, we'd go up there for a couple of weeks. We had kind of bio camp up there and they found all kinds of interesting stuff, new nesting records of birds that hadn't been known from Texas. I mean, really, really cool stuff that these guys love doing. Um, so all the while, this is building up. Remember, we're still in the wake of the famous Park Service public hearing, ride them out of town on a rail. I heard people showed up in war paint at that, Andy. Is that true or is that? I'm sure. Yeah, so. Anyway, we were going to have a board reception out there. We we're going to bring our board out. It's going to be a big deal, you know, show them the deal. So we had rented the little plaza behind the Olympia Hotel, kind of between the Olympia Hotel and, and the Olympia, what they used to call Olympia Dining Room. And we were going to have our reception. We had board members coming in from Dallas, Austin, Houston, San Antonio. Well, guess what? Some of the local folks who probably were at that uh, public hearing somehow got wind of this and any direction you came into Fort Davis, whether it was from Alpine or Balmeray or El Paso, they had graced the fences with these giant, I'm going to say, 15 by 5 foot banners that said, private property, yes, nature conservancy, no. Wow. We thought, wow, that was a pretty nice welcome. Um, and our board members were a little mystified, what's going on here? And, you know, we all know about the, the whole Trans Pecos Heritage Association and all that. And, and, you know, we took that message to heart and we realized that this project needed to be done 
in a private manner, working with private landowners, not involving any public funds or public protected areas. It had to be done working kind of within the norms of the community, and that was to try to preserve and protect functioning ranch land. So we got that message. I sure wish I would have collected one of those banners. That would have been a nice souvenir. It's somebody else's private property. Yeah, true. I did get a picture of myself next to one, though. So the next one I want to talk about is in every project, there's a what I call the jumping off the cliff moment, where you all have to sort of hold hands and say, OK, we're really going to do this. And I'm going to ask my colleague Robert to talk about that, because he was a big part of it. Well, we kind of as they described, we had we knew that the Davis Mountains were important. We knew it was going to have to be a private project. Um, unfortunately, it came up, um, the opportunity to buy it came up right when I had just started as, as state director, and we had a very large debt that our board was concerned about, very concerned about. And so this kind of gets, I know there are a lot of board members in the room, and there are a lot of executive directors who work with, with board members. And, you know, it was really the board that really decided to step up. Uh, we took it to the board. It was something that I, you know, we all felt like we had to, to consider. Um, wasn't real sure that the board was going to approve doing it. We kind of, we'd set it up so that it would be more <laughs> likely that they would uh, approve it. We were going to have the board meeting out in the Davis Mountains. We were going to have it at the McDonald Observatory. We were going to uh, have a members meeting the day before and have our members around and see the ranch and build excitement. And then we were going to meet there where you could oversee the Davis Mountains. It's a great venue for approving this kind of deal. I kind of wanted to set it up that way. The um, Monday morning before the board meeting that next weekend, I looked at the newspaper, and the, on the lead newspaper was that the um, um, Republic of Texas, if any of you remember this uh, kind of group that was out in the Davis Mountains that felt like that Texas hadn't been properly annexed and was independent and had been being watched by the authorities for a long time, they had, they had basically uh, reared their heads, taken their neighbors hostage, were holding them at gunpoint and all the law enforcement in the state was there and had the Davis Mountains surrounded. So we were going to be going out there that week with uh, <laughs> a couple of hundred of, uh, of members and uh, two or three dozen of our board members and saying, isn't this a wonderful place to buy? <laughs> and, um, and then so as the week progressed, it became pretty clear that that standoff was not going to end. We weren't going to be able to be there. I talked to the sheriff. We decided to move the meeting to Houston. So instead of meeting in this beautiful place overlooking the Davis Mountains where everybody would say, yes, I want to do this, we're meeting in this kind of grungy little conference room in Houston, and everybody had to change their travel plans and was a little grouchy about changing their travel plans. And we were talking about it. Uh, there. It wasn't the right setting. It wasn't what, what uh, I was hoping for when we were going to be deciding whether to take on $10 million of debt when we already had a lot of debt that people were very concerned about. Long story short, the board uh, discussed it for a while. It, it, it wasn't clear to me which way it was going to go. It could have gone either way. The board could have decided uh, that that was going to go either way. We had one, one board member, many of you know or know of him, Victor Emanuel, uh, runs the um, uh, bird tour group and he after we talked for a while and people were kind of going back and forth Victor stood up and said this place is so important that if you have to sell every other preserve that you own in order to buy it you need to do that and the board said okay let's do it and that was the moment and, and fortunately we didn't have to sell all the other preserves no, <laughs> so my last point I want to make is just what I'll call building a conservation neighborhood, something that we've learned and observed in this. As you start to put properties under easement, and you can see there's a lot of them that are kind of connected and all that, you start to get this synergy where, you know, one buyer comes in and, and then the land next to it that you're trying to get under easement, the, one of the great selling points is you can say, hey, listen, your view is going to be protected in perpetuity because that land's already under easement. And that just kind of snowballs and really helps you build that neighborhood. 
we have seen also, and, and Jeff, you talked about this a little in your session, how value seems to hold or even grow on these encumbered properties because they are so special, so unique. We've seen now on several of these properties, I think we're on what, our third generation of owner on a couple of them, and the values have held. There hasn't been a big issue of turning over property. So if anybody tells you you can't sell property that's encumbered by an easement, you can say that's not true. We found that it really is actually an asset. Most people see that as an asset. So thanks for letting me talk about this. Andy uh, talked about something that uh, reminded me of one of my favorite feelings in the world. And Robert and Andy are both responsible for, for that feeling on a number of occasions for me. It's the green light. Uh, I remember um, walking into Andy's office at Texas Parks and Wildlife in about 2001, and I had a, I say this endearingly, rat faced developer. Uh, that was willing to sell his property in Bastrop County, 2,200 acres, uh, that would almost have doubled the size of Bastrop State Park. And I walked in, and it was just Andy in his office, and uh, I made my case, and he kind of sat there for a little while, and he said, well, just go buy it. And that's a fantastic feeling. Um, so I had not met Ann Brokenbow since uh, uh, earlier this afternoon, but I did watch uh, from afar uh, what went on with, with her and her property in Eastern Travis County over the last couple of years and was amazed. Um, the, uh, the transaction that, that she was able to work through with the number of partners, uh, including the NRCS and Travis County and a couple of land trusts uh, and, and some private philanthropists was, uh, it, it, on scale, may not have been the Davis Mountains or South Padre Island, but in terms of degree of difficulty, I. <laughs> I'm an old whitewater rafter. I give it a class five. So, so Anne, uh, go ahead and uh, tell us your story. Thanks. Well, first of all, I just want to say I'm so honored to be up here with all you guys. Because if I could accomplish like a hundredth of what you guys have done, I would consider myself a huge success. So, um, and when Laurie asked me to speak, I said, "What do you want me to talk about?" Like, and she. She was like, "Just talk about what you talked about at dinner that night." Like, we were all out for dinner in Salt Lake City, and. It was Carolyn Vogel's birthday, and we had a couple bottles of wine on the table, and I didn't even know, I was like, Matt, I asked him last night, I don't know if Matt's here from Galveston, but I said, what did I talk about? And, and he's like, well, you were talking about, um, oh God, he's like, that you had no business owning that ranch, and that, you know, I had a group of inner city kids that came out this past summer, and to me, that was sort of like the highlight of, of this whole experience, because it was, it's the beginning of the end of my dream, which was to have this ranch and then to be able to share it with kids and have people out there and see them appreciate the land and the animals and everything. And, and when the kids came, the, the head of the program asked, she said, Ann, I want you to talk about conservation and how you say, you know, save this land, like the neighboring land. And I was like, I'm going to go off script here. And I started talking about to the kids, which relates to what you guys have been talking about, which is I told, I was asking the kids, what are your dreams? And don't, and I went around to each one and they told me their dreams, like the wild, you know, different, such different dreams. And I was like, do not take no for an answer. Like people will try to stand in your way. People will tell you you can't do it. But then other unexpected people will step up to help you. And that's what happened in this whole saving the land. You know, um, first of all, me buying the ranch in the beginning was, was not um, easy because I had, not only did I not have any money, I had, I was like $60,000 in debt and my family was totally against, you know, they were like, you can't do that. You can't buy a big ranch if, unless you have $10 million in the bank. And I was like, you know, and then, of course, the bank told me I couldn't do it either. So um, <laughs> I, I kept trying, though. I just didn't. I, I saw this beautiful piece of land, and I was like, somebody's got to keep this from getting developed. Like, the owner had sold it off in big pieces, and so I tried to, you know, first I tried to buy one piece, and I was lucky. I, I was able to do that. And then 
I tried to buy the other piece. My family disowned me after I bought the one piece, so I didn't tell them I was going to try to expand. And, um, and so, you know, I just, the owners took a chance on me. They, they saw, and that's what I told the kids, I said, you know, if, if somebody sees you have passion and you are a hard worker, they will step up to help you. Like, unex you know, people, your family might be standing in your way. They'll, you know, your family's the first one to tell you you can't do something because they, they want to protect you. They're doing it for a good reason. But anyway, so, um, so that was fun for me to be able to relate all that to the kids. But eventually, you know, I was able to get my hands on this land and hanging on to it was a struggle because, uh, you know, it's a working ranch. I make my land money. You know, I make my living off the land, which is you know running cattle. I have, you know raise hay. I had horses, and I thought outside the box. You know, I, had, I called the film commission, and I had people come out and you know filming commercials and movies out there to try to, to hang on to it, especially during the drought. And um, anyway, so that was I was struggling for a few years, and I had heard about this grant from the NRCS, um, and but I hadn't you know, kicked and I, I was like, I might try to do that someday. But you know, it's, it was, it, it wasn't like pressing at the moment. But um, until I drove down, you know, I was driving home one day and I saw this huge sign that the ranch below me, you know, had been broken up into lots and was for sale. And I just went into a tailspin and I was like, oh my God, like, you know, I went and laid on the bed for about five minutes moaning about what, what you know, what, what's the neighborhood's going to go to hell and anyway um and then i got on the phone which is i am like if, if you, you can probably hear my voice shaking i'm the most nervous shy introvert reclusive rancher i'm i live out in the middle of nowhere for a reason and um my parents make fun of me because i'm scared to call the they're like Anne's afraid to call the pizza guy but i got on the phone <laughs> And, and I got on the phone and I started calling people like everyone. I mean, I called Ann Ashman who had her, you know, who I knew had gotten this grant and I, you know, had lunch with her and she, you know, had talked to Jeff Francel. So thank you, Jeff, because you're the first person, like you gave Ann a bunch of names for me to call. And that's what I was going to thank you for earlier. It's like, you know, Ann armed me. I mean, I spent like an hour and she, you know, gave me all these numbers of people that probably didn't want me to call them. But like, Claude Ross and Hill Country Conservancy and Pines and Prairie. And I got on the phone and I called every single one of them. And everybody, you know, helped me and came out and looked at the ranch. And, you know, it just, it just snowballed. It was, um, it was amazing. Like, it really does take a village. And probably half the people in this room, Bob Ayers, I mean, everyone like, was so nice and met with me and talked to me and gave me ideas. and. And we just kept hammering away. Hill Country Conservancy, you know, took on both ranches. Oh, and I, I forgot the main part about going down, like, you know, the whole thing about not taking no for an answer. When I saw that sign, I was like, you know, most people might say, oh, that's too bad. But I went down and met with the developer, and I'm like, can this be stopped? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, if you have a million dollars. And of course, I did not, because I was struggling to hang on to my own ranch. But um, the... I got on the phone and started calling like all these, you know, potential conservation buyers. And I was like, you know, you want to buy a ranch in Texas? We might be able to get this grant. And and I got one guy to agree. I had met him one time, and he lived in New York to to come down and look at it. And the day, like, you know, a few days before he came down, I looked down and because it's like this huge um, prairie. I mean, it used to be native prairie. And before the developer got hold of it, and he had like root plowed the whole thing. But the day, a couple days before the the guy came down, the whole thing was covered in wildflowers, and and I was going to take him on a ride and and over it. And I was like, somebody is looking out for me, like I have a guardian angel. And so he agreed to buy it. And but the whole the whole process of trying to preserve both ranches. You know, I got him to buy it, or I got him to agree to buy it, and then of course the developer. When I said I've got a buyer for you, we've got a million dollars. We'll we'll buy it. You know, he's going to buy it. And of course the developer's like, oh well, I've got you know I've got someone else, another developer who's going to pay a million too. And I was like, oh my god. You know, he had my number. That guy, he was playing me. So every every step of this thing it was a roller coaster ride of, you know, just road. What did you call it? Obstacles and. They make Opposition. I mean, I, you know, I had to just, 
you know, there was, uh, and I had, I had, had a list of them because I was like, I can't forget to, you know, like in order to get mine preserved, I had to get, a, uh, get it designated as a state archeological landmark. We had to get funding, which was such a big process. Um, Travis County agreed to help us with the funding and then they couldn't actually fund it because they're like, you have to get a bill passed in the legislature in order for us to be able to fund it. And Tom Nichols, who helped us do that, is here. You know, and George Coe, I mean, so many people in this room from every single different um, land trust, like, you know, I can't even, I mean, Hill Country Conservancy, Texas Land Conservancy, Native, uh, Native Prairies, Pines and Prairies, you know, just we all worked together to like get that bill passed. Then after we got the bill passed, you know, we, we worked together to try to get the bond election passed. And I mean, it's just been like, it was, it was unbelievable how many steps and roadblocks. And of course the bill, got, the bill got passed, which was the very last day. I mean, this whole thing was just a nail biter like every single step of the way. Like it got passed the last possible day it could or something. And um, I'm trying to think what like, Anyway, so it, it's been it's been quite an experience, and I'm so, I'm so nervous. But um, so anyway, I told the kids like basically I learned you know just sort of hammered at home like you can't take no if if one roadblock is put into you like just think outside the box and there's there's got to be a way around it like that's my theory. I'm an I guess I'm an eternal optimist because I'm like if someone tells me no I'm like I don't hear that I'm not trying to hear that and. Um, and being one other thing I learned about being a squeaky wheel, like, you know, when you go down to Travis County, it's amazing. Like, no, you know, go to the, we've had, I've had to go to the, I never thought I'd become a, an activist of any kind, but, um, you know, I've gone down to commissioner's court so many times and the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So like, you know, I don't take no for an answer. I try not, I try to do it in a nice way, but um, anyway, I just want to thank everybody who helped me, like all the different land trusts, Travis County, I'm trying to see if I forget anyone else. You know, every, there are so many people involved. Braun so, and huh? Braun and Gresham, who cracked the whip. <laughs> when, like, I'm like, you know, I want, one thing I've learned about myself too is I get these great ideas like my Braun, Braun I, I asked them out to, it, to look at the land and help me and told them my big vision, which was like not only to save these two ranches, but like, 4,000 acres in this watershed and then keep going, you know, it's, it's a lifelong, it's a lifelong project. I, you know, it's, it's going to take the rest of my life to get it all done, you know, 4,000 plus acres all the way to the Colorado River. But um, <coughs> David Braun and that whole team kept cracking the whip. If I'd flag, if my energy would flag, you know, I'm like, let's do it. And then, and then, you know, uh, David Braun would call me like every week and crack the whip to make me go down to the legislature, do all these different things, and Cassie's here. So anyway, there were, and John Beal. John Beal and I, then, because of all this, we tried to, we start, we formed our own land trust to kind of, um, we, we want to work with, we want to work with all the existing land trust to keep doing deals in our neighborhood, and, and ours will be one to pick up the ones that are like too small and fill in the gaps that the other ones don't want to do. So thank you guys.